Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started this morning. Dear Lord, we come to you today, and I just um, I pray again that your Holy Spirit fill this place. Lord, that you allow my eyes to be your eyes, that you allow my mouth to be your mouth, that you allow my ears to be your ears, that you allow my heart to be your heart. Lord, I pray that you work in and through us this morning, and Lord, that you draw us close to you. For it's in your holy and precious name we pray, amen. I had a uh, short video that we're not going to be able to watch this morning. The title of my message is, Here's Your Sign. Now, I got to thinking about this. A lot of you in the room don't remember those comments, Here's Your Sign. How many of you remember, Here's Your Sign by Bill? I forget his last name. All right, so you know. You know. Well, I had a nice little appropriate clip for this message, but it's not going to play this morning. But that's kind of where uh, <laughs> it's kind of what come to my mind as I was preparing and going through this message, because we are always looking for signs and directions in our life. Regardless of where we're going and what we're doing, we all have some signs. So I have a few signs here. Um, let's go to the second slide there. Now, my neighborhood is trying to get this slide put up, I believe. No, not that one. Back one. That was the next one. <clears throat> there it is. There's the one. So my wife, my wife makes me walk every afternoon. And um, rumor is that they're going to try to put this sign up in the neighborhood. Heavy pedestrian traffic. All right, now the next one. <clears throat> Children left unattended will be sold to the circus. Now, I'm going to present this to the deacons for approval uh, at our next deacons meeting. I feel like this will help our budget process and also with volunteers getting to leave on time. So any children left unattended will be sold to the circus. All right, now one that we go all be familiar with and that we see all the time. All right, when you see this sign, how fast should you go? <laughs> All right, so that sign tells me, hey, I'm supposed to be going 55. Let me show you what my wife sees. Next slide. <laughs> 85. We've uh, been to the eye doctor. We've had eyes checked, but she still sees 85 regardless of what we do. Uh, that's the sign that she sees. There are signs throughout our life. And as I was driving to church this morning, you know, Romans 3.23 says that we're all sinners. So if we're all sinners, we're actually on an interstate to a place that we don't want to go. And there's a sign that says, hey, Jesus to the right. And we have to make a turn at some point to spend eternity with him. Let me show you this next sign that we see a lot of times. And I was thankful that I can remember this sign this past week. You know, even though low spots and some houses are damaged and there's things that happen, there's still this promise that God will never flood this earth again. And that's a sign for us. Go to the next slide, please. This is the Ten Commandments. You say, well, how, how is that a sign? Well, it's a sign. It gives us direction. Signs give us directions, right? Like we should be running 55 when we see the 55 sign. That's direction. Ten Commandments give us directions on how we live. Exodus 19 through 24, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and laws and regulations for personal conduct and community matters. These Ten Commandments give us signs and directions for our life. Now, the next slide is signs of Jesus. And the first one is Jesus turns water into wine. And this is all in, in John. So there's seven signs in John. And, um, and so that's the first one. Jesus heals the official son. And that's actually where we go park today and go over that sign that is given to us. Jesus makes the lame walk. Jesus walks on water. Jesus feeds the multitudes. Jesus gives sight to the blind. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus is our answer. He is our sign that gives us direction to our life. John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes through the Father except through me. Jesus is our sign. 
We will be in John 46, chapter 4, verse 46 through 54 today. But before we read this scripture, I want to kind of catch you up to John chapter 4. So in John chapter 1, the very few, first few verses, the word became flesh. So Jesus became flesh. Also in chapter 1, John the Baptist is on the scene preparing the way for the Messiah. He's preparing the way for Jesus. He's telling people, hey, the Messiah's coming. Jesus calls the first disciples later in chapter 1. The wedding at Canaan, Jesus turns water into wine. Jesus cleansed the temple in John chapter 2. The Pharisees are hearing of this man named Jesus and this ministry of John the Baptist, and they're getting nervous. The Pharisees are the religious leaders. They're worried about their power and authority being affected. So they try to start conflict between John the Baptist and Jesus there in chapter 3. And John the Baptist says, no, this is the Messiah that I've been telling you is coming. He's here. And then Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And we're all familiar with that story. And this is where we pick up. So this is what's been going on in John up to this point. I've asked Ann Delario to come and read the scripture for us today. So if you will stand up as we read God's word, he's going to come up and read it for us today. Got it. Hey guys. So, uh, so he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judah to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And him and he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judah to Galilee. Thank you. Give Ian a hand for reading God's word for us. So Ian feels a call to the ministry, not sure exactly where and what, but what a better place to start training and getting in front of people and reading God's word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as the scriptures that we just read. Lord, we just come to you today and just ask again that you open our eyes and hearts to these verses that we're going to look at today. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So make sure your Bible's open to John chapter 4 or that you have a bulletin or something to take notes on as we go because we're going to go verse by verse. The title of my message today is Here's Your Sign and we should rest on our faith that Jesus is the only sign that we need. Nothing else. He gives us all the directions we need. We don't always understand it. We don't always know where we're heading. But when our faith and trust is in Jesus, that is the only sign we need. In verse 46, he said, So he came again to Galilee, Cana in Galilee, where he had made water into wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. Now, the Bible doesn't explain exactly who this man is. And we're talking about this official. All right, the Greek word, who I'm not even going to stand up here and tell you that I can pronounce, but it implies that he's a nobleman. He's a court officer or maybe a political figure. In other words, this man has authority and power and money. All right, he could have been Jewish. He could have been Gentile. The text does not really tell us here. All we know is that this man's son is sick. And he's coming to Jesus. And more than likely, this is not the first thing that he tried. You remember, because he has money, and he has power, and he has authority. So I'm sure he tried to use all of those things to get his son better before he ever come to Jesus. How many times do we try everything before we go to Jesus with our issues? 
You know, we're, we're the first one. We'll go to the world for answers. We'll go to pills and drugs and sex and alcohol and power and money and authority to try to solve all the problems that we have. And at the end of life, none of that matters. All that matters is what you did with the sign, Jesus. Just because you see the sign does not mean that you get into heaven. Just because you hear the sign that you hear Jesus does not mean that you get in heaven. I think about that interstate again that we're all sinful and that we're riding on. And just because you pass that sign does not mean that you go into heaven. You have to make a turn. You have to make that decision. Jesus has come as my first point in these first few verses here. Jesus has come. Jesus says, I have come into this world as a light so that whoever believes in me will not remain in darkness. He says also, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus came to save me and you. That's the reason that he has come. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. People like me and you who are not worth saving if we're really honest. That's who Jesus came for. Jesus is the answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. That doesn't mean that we're good and that we don't have to do anything. We have to make the decision to hold up the sign, Jesus is my Savior. And I know we get a visual with a sign over our head, but really, when you love Jesus, you don't have to hold a sign. People see it. It's visible. It's obvious. You don't have to tell them. They know when you love Jesus. Moving on to verse 47. When this man heard that Jesus had come to Judea, to Galilee. Do you see the official, the rich man, the one with power, the one with authority. When he heard what? When he heard Jesus had come. Now you got to remember Jesus had only been on the scene and doing his ministry just a short time. I read the things that happened up to this point. That would be the only information that this guy would have. And this is his last ditch effort. He knows his son is sick. He's desperate. The man was referencing that he came within walking distance of his area. Now the best that the maps tell us, he traveled about 20 miles. Not in an air conditioner car, by foot. Jesus is within walking distance of you today. But we have to go to him. How many of you have heard that Jesus has come? That he has died on a cross, that he was buried for our sins, and that he rose again? I'd be willing to bet that most of you in the room are at least familiar with that story. We have heard that story before. Just like this man in the scripture, you've heard the story. Now what must we do? The very next sentence says, he went to him. The man with authority and power went to Jesus. So he knew that Jesus had come and now he went to him. The directions are still the same today. We know he has come. We have to go to him. This man went to Jesus. He had to make a decision. He could have stayed where he was and done nothing. You have an option to stay where you are and leave this place the same way that you walked in. You have an option to leave and do absolutely nothing. This man had the same. But you see, he was desperate because his son was sick. I'm sure that this man in authority, this had to be a humbling experience just like Cole had to call his daddy, hey, I have run out of gas. That's a humbling experience. This man had to humble himself to say, hey, I don't have enough power. I don't have enough of money. I don't have enough authority to fix this issue. I must find Jesus. He puts everything aside to go find Jesus. He was desperate because his son was dying. 
What are you desperate for today? Now, I doubt that there's many in here that their son is on his deathbed. But there's a lot of things that we can be desperate for. You could be going through a spiritual fire. You could have pain and suffering. You could have just experienced death in your family. You could have relationship troubles with your marriage or with your family or with your friends. Your prayers might not be answered the way you think they should be answered. The outcome you hope for may not have, have come out. When it's just a, not just a weekend of trouble, but it's a year of agony and defeat. God doesn't do it the way that you had hoped for. What are you desperate for today? Because Jesus is waiting. He's here. He's within walking distance. He's waiting for us to come to him. Jesus has come. Just like we keep trying to do things on our own. He's in walking distance today. We don't have to do this on our own because we know it'll be a journey and it'll be hard to give it to Jesus. And it is. I'm sure it was hard for this gentleman that we're reading about today to, to give up his power and authority, to put it on the line, to go and heal what he was desperate for. It's a humbling experience. It's not easy. You know what? People may find out. Your friends may find out. Your family may find out. You know what? They went to Jesus. I might have to do things different. Yeah, you will. In order to hold up that sign that Jesus is the way, you do things different. That's why you don't have to hold the sign up. People know. That man follows Jesus. When you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it changes you. You don't ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Leave here and the same person that you were. It just doesn't happen. Jesus changes you. This man knew that it was a 20-mile journey, that it was going to be hard, that it was going to be hot. This was the problem this was not probably his last ditch effort. This was probably his last ditch effort. I'm sure with his wealth and his power, like I've mentioned before, he had tried everything. Church, you don't have to wait to this point. You don't have to try everything within your power. Just go ahead and come to Jesus. Don't wait and let that be your last ditch effort. Come to him today and lay it at his feet because he's waiting. Jesus is waiting for you. In that same verse, it says, and asked him to come and heal his son, talking about the, the rich man, the official, for he was at the point of death. So the man has asked Jesus, come, come down and heal my son, for he is at the point of death. Jesus has pleaded, he has begged, the official begged for Jesus to come and heal his son. When was the last time you pleaded and beg Jesus for something. Jesus is working whether we see him or whether we don't. Jesus is listening whether you hear him or whether you don't. Jesus hears you. We don't always have to receive signs and wonders. We must have faith that go beyond the signs and wonders. Just because you don't see a sign or you don't see a wonder, you have to have faith that Jesus is still working. Even though it may not suit you, it may not be how you had planned, Jesus is still working. And that's my second point. Jesus is working. Verse 48 says, So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Jesus is saying, You people want signs and miracles. That same problem still exists today. We want to pray and we want Jesus to fix it. And then we want to go live our life and do whatever we want to do once he fixes our problem. And when he doesn't, we say, Oh, he didn't hear our prayer. Or he's not working in my life. Or he's no good. And that's not how it works. 
This was a problem then. It's still a problem today. Things will hurt us. They're going to happen to us. There's things that's going to happen that we don't understand. There's things that's going to happen that's going to be hard for you to get through. We ask and we want immediate responses. We want our will to be done, not his will. That's a lot of times what we're praying for. We're praying for our will, not his will. Remember in Luke twenty two forty two, 42, before Jesus faces crucifixion, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the heart that we have to pray. 49, the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Again, he asked Jesus, Come down. My son is at the point of death. Lord, please come down. Come down. It's life or death. My son is dying. I need you. In verse 50, it says, Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. Now, again, I want you to remember, this man doesn't know a whole lot about Jesus. Jesus has only been doing his earthly ministry just a short time. He's traveled 20 miles to go get Jesus and bring him back to his house to heal his son. And what does Jesus tell him? He said, go, your son will live. Did it happen like the man thought it was? Like he thought it should have happened he told him go your son will live a 20 mile journey I don't know that I could have turned around and went home when I was expecting one thing and got a whole different answer that would have been a hard journey so many times we have our own plans of how we expect Jesus to respond And when his response doesn't align with our expectation, we mistakenly think that he doesn't respond to us at all. Those prayers that you pray and you think Jesus didn't respond, he hears you. It just might not be how you want it answered. I know I was remembered about this last week. I had the privilege of preaching a funeral One week ago today, a 38-year-old man passed away. He left four beautiful children behind. That's hard. It's hard for the family. It's hard to stand up and preach. What do you say? God, why? The man's 38. He has so much life ahead of him. He had four lovely kids. Why? Why put them through that? You sit and ask, and just being honest and transparent, the only thing that I could preach was Jesus. I didn't know anything else to say. I don't have words to comfort this family and say, hey, it's going to be better. What do you, nothing I can say can replace a dad. Nothing I say can heal the heart, but I know the maker who can. And I went to that funeral, and I preached Jesus just as hard as I know how to preach him, which isn't probably the best in the world, but it's the best that I had at the time. After I finished preaching Jesus, I said, if you would like to meet that Jesus for the first time, I just want you to raise your hand here. 19 people raised their hand to save Jesus as a Lord and Savior. We said the sinner's prayer right there at that funeral. Out of those 19, 14 of them, I challenged them to come give me their name and number, and I got 14 of those 19 names and numbers. That doesn't make the death any easier, but Jesus is working even when we don't see him working. Going all the way up to that service, it's hard to see where the work's being done in situations like that. Jesus is working even if we don't see him, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of pain and suffering and death and agony and anxiety and addiction and doubt and worry and loneliness and family issues and marriage issues and relationship issues. And if I didn't name it, you fill in the blank. blank. Regardless of what you're going through, Jesus is working. Nothing you are going through is too big 
for Jesus. Listen what the man did. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and he went on his way. That's an easy sentence to read, but that's a hard one to apply to our life. He didn't ask questions. He didn't doubt him. He didn't what if him. He didn't say, well, what if this? What if that? He left. He believed and he left. What do you need to believe Jesus for today? This man believed him with his son's life and just Jesus' word. Knowing something and hoping for something is not the same as having faith in something. Just because you know Jesus, just because you can tell me the Christmas story and the Easter story and you know of Jesus and who he is and what he did does not mean that you have faith in him. Don't trust in that for faith because it's not. This does not make you a Christian. I'm not sure that all people... Understand that. I feel like sometimes as church, we do a poor job of telling you that. Just because you know the stories, just because you come to church does not mean that you've got a seat in eternity with our Savior. Hoping you are going to make it to heaven is not enough. You must have faith in Jesus, whatever it takes. You have to have assurance in your salvation. And that's what you need today. I sit down with a lot of people and talk with them through their spiritual life. And I never belittle a spiritual experience when they were younger or smaller or whatever age. But what I want you to understand is you need to have assurance in your salvation. You need to have assurance if you take your last breath right now in First Baptist Barmel that your eternity is in heaven. It doesn't matter what you did when you were seven or eight. I need you to have assurance today that you're good. If you're not, if that looks like a rededication or a baptism or maybe, hey, you have to even just question, was I ever saved? Do that. Don't. Leave today thinking maybe I'll get into heaven. That's not good enough. Come to this altar. Pray. Leave it at Jesus' feet. Whatever you need to do, make this happen. Be able to walk away today with his word and his promise that if you put your faith and trust in him, that you're going to spend eternity in heaven. We leave with the same word that that man in the scripture left with. Do not, church, do not almost make it to heaven. That's no good. Almost works for a lot of things in life, but this time it won't work for you. You can't almost make it. Or maybe I will. Maybe and almost just are not good enough today. Or ever will be good enough. Don't leave today unless you know that you know that you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Verse 51, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. This man had servants, which confirms what I've been telling you the whole time, that he was wealthy, that he had authority and power. He was going back home with just Jesus' word, your son will live. Whatever trouble you have and walked in here with today, you can leave with the confidence that Jesus has a word for you today. Verse 52, so he asked them the hour he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The boy was healed the moment that Jesus spoke. Jesus' power is not limited to space or distance. So if you feel like you're 127 miles from Jesus, that's okay. Because space and distance does not matter to him. He can do a miracle in your life today. Jesus' powers have no limit. Have you allowed 
that space and distance between you and your relationship with Jesus? You know, it's, it's so awkward, especially Christians, when we start sin, sinful lifestyles, we run from Jesus. As we get sin in our life, we just run from Jesus. And really, when we're struggling with sin, we should run to him instead of away from him. The man's prayer had been answered before he ever knew it. Jesus does not wait on our approval before he does his will. Verse 53, the father knew that the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live, and he himself believed, and all of his household believed. Do you know what that's saying? That the man accepted Jesus as his Savior, and his household, and his servants also did. When we trust in Jesus with things, miracles happen. Things happen. People's lives change. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me today and say, hey, if I come and give my life to Jesus, everything's going to be perfect. That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is when you give your life to Jesus, he'll take you through what you're going. He'll bring you out on the other side. Is it hard? Yes, it's hard. Is it going to be rough? Yes, it's going to be rough. But Jesus is the sign that you need to leave here with today, regardless of what you're facing. Verse 54, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had came from Judea to Galilee. As we close, I want to just repeat some of the things that we covered today. Jesus has come. Jesus is working. Jesus is waiting. What's he waiting for? He's waiting on you. What are you desperate for today? Satan has a strategy, and it's simple. It's to make sin look normal and righteousness to look weird. All right, sin can look normal all day long. Righteousness is doing right in the eyes of God. And that all of a sudden looks weird in our today's culture. Righteousness happens doing right in the eyes of God. You know when that happens? When you fall in love with Jesus. That's when righteousness takes place. Jesus brings life when we see only death. What are you desperate for today? Are you the one going through that fire, through that pain and suffering, through death, through relationship issues? Do you feel like your prayers are going unanswered, unheard? Did you have hope for an outcome and it just didn't happen? Are you going through a season of agony and defeat? Whatever you're facing today, Jesus is the answer. The father who was desperate to keep his child alive went to Jesus. The same Jesus that me and you can come to today. He will hear you. He'll be here with you. Whatever it takes for you to have assurance in your salvation. Whatever you need to do today. If you need to come up front and pray with me. If you need to come pray by yourself. If you need to rededicate your life. If you say, hey, I want to be baptized again. If you just need to come to the altar and play, whatever you need to do, make it happen today. Because Jesus is waiting on you. We're all headed down a road that leads to hell. And there's a sign, Jesus is waiting. We just have to turn and go. This worried and fearful father ran to the same Jesus that you can run to today. He's waiting on you. 
Dear Lord, as we come to a time of response, Scripture tells us that your son is waiting to receive us. Regardless of what we've done, where we've been, what we're going through, nothing is too big for Jesus. This altar is open for anyone, whether this is the first time you've stepped foot in this church or whether you've been here as long as you can remember. Jesus is waiting on all of us. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.